Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Purple Insider. Matthew Collar here and joining me on the show, Ben Gessling, Vikings beat reporter for the Star Tribune. What an off season it's been, Ben. Have you been busy? You having a good time? This is, this is, we're not used to this signing no. players on day one of free agency, talking about quarterbacks legitimately in the draft. This is different, man. Yeah, it's, uh, it's moving at a speed that we are not terribly accustomed to around here, at least in terms of uh, the changes at the most important position in the game. And that is going to drive. I mean, we're not even close to done. I mean, this is going to go for the, the things to talk about, the things to chew on are going to go for a long time. So, uh, yeah, lots to lots to discuss today. And I'm, I'm sure we'll have plenty to uh, chew on for weeks, months at a time here, maybe even years, depending on how we evaluate the quarterback thing that may be coming. Well, it usually doesn't uh, happen as quickly as it did for someone like yeah. C.J. Stroud, where they know right away, uh, which gives us lots of content to cover a quarterback. But let's not jump the line here because I want to go back before we get to the spot where we are right now. And of course, it can always uh, change very quickly on us when I record a podcast. But I want to go back to the decision because the way I feel about this offseason, Ben, is that it's gone perfectly to plan how we would have drawn it up from the day Kwesi Adafo Mensa and Kevin O'Connell got here to compete, to slowly tear down last year, move on from some of the older parts, and then now to draft a quarterback. Uh, but the decision was muddied up by Kirk Cousins' love and appreciation for the way that he played in 2022 and then the way he yeah. was playing right before he got hurt. And I think the biggest question that a lot of people had going into the decision 2024, the biggest in the country, in my opinion, uh, for decisions, uh, but uh, like going into it, there was a question if they would bring back Kirk, if they would pay his dollar figure. So take me back first through that decision to where we got now and, and and what went into that process from your understanding? Yeah, it's interesting because they wanted him back. I mean, they talked about that fairly publicly, but in negotiations, my understanding is there was a pretty firm line just as there was last year. And a lot of that was the guarantee structure. When he talked to us in January, he said, the structure is the most important thing and that's everything that's not the dollars. That was not an accident, I don't think, because a lot of that was informed by what happened last year. They were willing to guarantee the 2024 season for him, or through 2024, last year. It would have been guaranteeing 23, guaranteeing 24, not guaranteeing 25. My understanding this year is that they were willing to guarantee 24 again and probably offer some guaranteed money into 25, but I don't think that would have been a full guarantee. And they have had a lot of these you know, where it's guaranteed at one point and then it becomes fully guaranteed later, kind of these rolling guarantees they like to use. I don't think it was the no question about it, you are getting two full guaranteed years thing that he got from the Falcons at any point from the Vikings. So when you go there, he is going to say, okay, well, I'm going to go look at my options. And I think they knew that once he got a chance to do that, it was going to go how it did because – if they were going to get something done with him, it probably would have happened before he got to the open market. Sounded like the offer he signed from Atlanta, which would have been a very hard offer, I think, for anybody to turn down, came in late. Sounded like that came in uh, just a few hours before he signed it, or at least the discussions uh, kind of got to that point uh, Monday morning. And obviously the Falcons make him an offer that he can't refuse and and he's gone. But I my sense is that the Vikings were fairly – clear and fairly firm in where they wanted to be because a lot of this was going to be affected by what they do next. I don't think they were going to ever give Kirk Cousins the type of contract that he got from Atlanta that effectively takes the Falcons out of the quarterback market in a lot of ways. I mean, Kirk Cousins, it, in more ways than one, got them to sign away their ability to get the next guy, at least in this draft. I don't think there's any viable, sensible way for the Falcons to do that. The Vikings were not willing to go that far. And they said, we want to give ourselves the option to get your successor in here. And if you want to come back, we want to have you back. We want to have you kind of be the 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 solution for now as we work on the solution for later. But that is a weird spot to put the quarterback as well. And I think they knew that. And, and ultimately, he found the offer he found. But they 
for all of their interest in having him back, had parameters that were going to be tied to that, and, and they didn't really move off of those parameters very much from my understanding of it. So it, it always struck me that if Kevin O'Connell had it exactly his way, he would have Kirk no. Cousins as his quarterback for 2024. Well, Drake May or J.J. McCarthy or whoever sat on the bench and watched Kirk operate, and then they would be ready to turn it over. But the thing is, in football, Ben, you don't always get what you want. And, no, you, and you can't always draw it up perfectly. And I know that everybody loves the quarterback who sits for a while because we've looked to our East and watch it work for uh, Aaron Rodgers and Jordan Love, and of course, Patrick Mahomes as well. Um, so I can understand the fear from Kevin O'Connell. And I think this is one of the biggest discussion points is how O'Connell feels right now about this situation. Because yeah. if you're O'Connell, you would have looked at 2024 like, all right, let's get some defensive players. Let's push some money down the road. Let's have a competitive season. So I don't have two losing seasons in a row. A seven win season does something to coach brain because the way the NFL works is if you have one or two down seasons, then they just fire you. But I think that if the Wilfs are in, you know smart about this and, and that they, if they have some patience in watching the plan come to fruition, that O'Connell shouldn't feel that terror. And I also think with the situation, the Vikings can put a quarterback in right now with Sam Darnold, you could still win games with Sam Darnold, not, 13 games, but games. And uh, if the quarterback that they draft is ready to go, then everybody could be talking about you the same way they're talking about the Texans because of the situation that you could put the quarterback in. But I understand from Kevin O'Connell's perspective yeah. that there is so much more work to do now. I mean, he could have had a couple of Cabo trips if Kirk is there, right? Like, I don't need to change the offense a whole lot, but now it's like whoever you draft, you better really design that and tailor that to a young quarterback. Yeah, especially if it's Jaden Daniels or somebody that plays completely differently than what you have wanted your quarterbacks to do and what you have constructed your offense to be. It is going to be a busier offseason for him in that sense of it. I agree with you, though, about the Darnold <clears throat> side of this because Darnold does not come in here with any equity. He does not come in here with any sort of tie goodwill financial or otherwise that makes you have to start him if you draft drake may and drake may looks terrific in training camp and you're like this guy's ready to go now let's put him on the field week one there's nobody that's going to be sitting there pushing for no we have to stick with sam darnold we, we love sam he's got all this history in the fan base all this you know tradition of success all of these things there's none of that so if you get somebody in here that you feel like you hit a home run on and this guy is ready to go, there's nothing keeping you from putting that guy on the field. That would have been a different story with Kirk. And I think if they had done it, if they had signed Kirk, you you obviously know he's your starter and you're moving forward with him for this year. And I'd certainly it makes it easier for Kevin O'Connell, the guy that has to call the plays, design the offense, make it all work in the locker room, all of those things. But I did always kind of wonder, and I heard a little bit of this even last week, that <clears throat> this scenario they were trying to pull off, this, this two-step that they were trying to do where you sign Kirk and then you draft his replacement in the same year, the trick to that was always going to be how is Kirk going to feel about the idea that the highest drafted quarterback in Vikings history probably is – sitting behind him in the in the quarterback meeting room and sitting over his shoulder. If they move up one spot in the draft and take a quarterback, that quarterback is the highest drafted quarterback in Vikings history. Never drafted anybody higher than Dante Culpepper in 1999 at number 11. So if they stay where they are, they match it. If they move up, it's the highest quarterback in Vikings history. So Kirk Cousins, say he starts the way he did last year or the team starts the way it did last year, where he's thrown for a lot of yards, but they're losing games and they have some of the turnovers that they had. How quickly is the fan base going to be calling for the replacement to come in? And I, I did always wonder, how is Kirk going to feel about that? And how is that going to inform the negotiations? Because I think I asked him at the end of the season, you know, what do you think of this idea that they're going to draft somebody? And he said something kind of, well, I understand that they would do it. They'd be silly not to look at it. He never really said Oh, I'm I'm great with this. This is going to be, you know, we'll make it work. I'm totally fine with this kind of an arrangement. He basically said, I understand where they're coming from. But then when you get to the negotiating table, I do wonder how much that changed 
how willing he was going to be to come back and, and what kind of terms he was going to be willing to accept. So all of that, I think, colored the negotiations. I think it colored how they would have tried to put this thing together. And in some ways, having a Sam Darnold that you can kind of just push aside whenever you're ready to do it, uh, it maybe makes it harder in the short term for Kevin O'Connell, but I think there is a little bit of a silver lining there in the sense that that player is kind of uh, easy to lift out of the situation when you're ready to go there. So I was thinking, as you're talking about that, of uh, a time early in my uh, broadcast career where I had two jobs that I, I thought I was going to have as offers and one of them dropped out and I was kind of mad about it. And I was like, oh man, I, I wanted that one more than the other one. So I ended up taking the other one and it worked out way better. I think the guy who took the other job got fired after like a year. It was a total disaster, whatever. And uh, I was like, oh man, well, thank goodness that I ended up with this. It's sort of the same way where like in you could see in a coach's mind where it's like, okay, I've got Kirk and I'm good and then come back and we'll draft the quarterback. I'll develop him on the side with a square yeah. jawed Josh McCown. We'll set him over there and uh, that'll be all great. But as you mentioned, in practice, it's different than in your imagination, where if you start two and four and he comes into U.S. Bank Stadium and they're chanting, Drake May, Drake May. Yeah. And yeah. not only that, but you also wouldn't have had the player that you were going to draft at 11 who you needed to help you right away. So you probably weren't going to be that competitive anyway. Also, I mean, let's talk about the future cap situation. They can put any amount of dollars into 2025 for any of these contracts, which we'll talk about in a minute with the, the players that they've signed. But now they can say, all right, we don't have the cap space right now, but let's structure it for the future. They can get whoever they want. They could make a trade for somebody if they wanted to. Their flexibility is so much more open for the future because of this. And then they don't have to be turning it over to J.J. McCarthy in 2026 and be going, Oh yeah, but we do have that dead cap hit. That's like $28 yeah. million, right? So after this, yeah. after this year, they're rid of it. And now they can bring somebody else in and get them going right away. Plus whoever they draft gets to feel like the guy right off the yeah. bat. You are yeah, the guy, for sure. but, but we got to talk about the draft part of it. So they make this trade with the Texans. And then I assumed Ben that I shouldn't even do a reaction podcast because there was another trade coming. What is, what is your, uh, um, what is your sense for what yeah. is going on with the trade for Houston and what that means for next and maybe a, a timeline for this? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting to me because I, I don't for a second think they made that trade with the idea of, well, let's just give ourselves two swings at it in the first round. I, I think that trade was 100% made with the idea that you're taking those two picks and probably another first rounder and trying to move up to get your quarterback. I think that has been their approach the whole time. They're not going to take a half measure and say, well, this is the guy that's here. We don't love him, but he's he's available to us. Let's just take him and, and try to make the best of it. I think the plan here is let's swing for the fences. Let's get the guy that we're in love with and do what we have to do to get him. So I think this trade was 100% about moving up to get who you want to get. There's been a lot of discussion over the weekend about did Quasey have kind of a, a handshake agreement with one of those teams in the top five, you know, maybe the, the Cardinals at four, maybe the, the Chargers at five about moving up to go get your guy. Uh, my question with that, I guess, would be if that's the case, can you bank on that? I mean, they have more first-round picks to play with than any of the other teams that would try to move up. But if that's going to be the, the way it goes, why wouldn't you just go get that done? And kind of like you're saying, turn around, make sure you have it, make sure you lock it in. Maybe they are still trying to see what they can do, trying to, to play a few different teams against each other to see what kind of offer they can get. But it is, a, I think there's a little bit of risk in it. I, there's probably pieces of this that we don't know. There's probably things discussions that are happening that make them think we're going to be fine with getting to where we need to get to, to get the quarterback we want. I am. Yeah, if you move up to four with the Cardinals who don't need a quarterback, that feels a little risky to me in the sense of if it goes Williams, Daniels may, then you're JJ McCarthy. And you don't really get a shot at any of the other guys. I, I would think the hope would be to try to get to three with the Patriots, but you know maybe there's still a little bit of negotiation that has to go on there. I, I would think you'd want to be no lower than three, so you sort of 
assure yourself you're getting one of those three, whether it's, well, it's, well it won't be Williams. It's the, At that point, it's either Daniels or May. And then if you like McCarthy better, you can play with that too. But I, I would think you'd want to give yourself at least the option to get one of those guys. My impression would be that Drake May, if you can get him, would be the guy that they would kind of say, Let, let's go. I mean, I think they like him a lot, and I think he fits really well. So that's the name that I kind of keep an eye on is how what would it take for them to get Drake May? And when I'm putting together the puzzle pieces, uh, as you know, we, we got like the yarn and the clippings and everything, and we're just putting it together. Yeah. But the always it's always sunny guy where he's doing all the the, <laughs> the scenarios and this fits with this and it all fits together, this kind of thing. Cliff Kingsbury worked with Kyler Murray running quarterback. Marcus Mariota yeah. was signed by Washington to be their backup. They got okay. rid of Sam Howell, Here's more of a pocket quarterback. All of this is sort of looking like Jaden Daniels, right, for them. Yeah. Uh, that that they're bringing in somebody who's worked with a running quarterback before. How well he worked with that running quarterback may be up for debate. But uh, now number three, though, is so interesting because if I'm the New England Patriots, I want also to be able to pick my guy if they want a quarterback. So part right. of this discussion has to either be talking them out of a quarterback or talking about some other maneuvering where they move back to 11 and then back up to four because yeah. – I don't know. There's something about the Patriots that screams JJ McCarthy to me. It could be that their legendary quarterback was from Michigan. The whole idea Didn't have the biggest of, arm in the world. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah, right. He's, he's a winner, that kind of thing, yeah. you know, like yep. that, that would, yep. you could see Robert Kraft being like, Oh yeah, it looks like a shorter Tom Brady. Yeah, um, whereas sweet. I think, and you, and you mentioned Drake may, I think that your instincts are similar to mine on this with uh, Kevin O'Connell, that he would want to go up to three to try to guarantee himself Drake May. And worst case scenario, Washington surprises us and you still get Jaden Daniels. But I think there are tiers to this. I think Caleb Williams is in his own tier and he's number one with a bullet. But then the, you know, the next tier is clearly Daniels and May. And after right. that, there's a drop off to J.J. McCarthy. I think the Vikings should be fine if it's J.J. McCarthy. But I just look at Drake May and I go, Kevin O'Connell. I mean, the way yeah. that he throws the football and and that was, look, we, we heard this from O'Connell when we sat down with him at the combine. I mean, he said, number one is how you throw the football that, and which yeah. of course makes sense, but sometimes gets lost in the wash of draft analysis. But uh, g give me your, your take on that, because I feel like this whole thing has to be to try to get Drake May. Yeah, I think it is. And I, I think they have watched him. I think they have liked him for a while. I think even last year when they talked about moving up, they were always going to be a little bit reserved in how aggressive they got because they knew that this was a really good quarterback class. I mean, even last year, I had conversations with people thinking, yeah, this is this is already in their mind that they have this kind of ace in the hole with Williams and May at the top of that 2024 draft class. So when you're looking at it that way, when you're looking at you know, even this far back of how are we going to play all of this? How are we going to negotiate with Kirk Cousins in 2023 and 2024? There is a plan that I think has certain people involved. And it's not just, like I say, it's not just this, well, you know, whoever's there, we'll be happy to have them and, and we'll move on and make the best of it. I think this is going to be whatever we have to do, let's get the guy we want. And I think Drake may is that guy. I think Drake May fits very, very well with what Kevin O'Connell wants in a quarterback. Certainly has the arm strength and I think probably a little bit of the panache to make some of the throws that he always wanted Kirk Cousins to make. I mean, he would kind of allude to this every once in a while and, and Kirk would talk about it a little bit too. This this kind of friendly uh, needling of, hey, you can you can trust yourself a little bit more here. You can be a little more aggressive. You can put the ball up to Justin Jefferson when we need you to do it. Um, you heard a little bit of that dance happen with those two over the last couple of years. And I think with Wes Phillips kind of involved in that conversation as well, I don't think you would have to uh, urge Drake May into that as much. You may have to pull him back, but I think the, the guy that thinks I can throw it over the middle 18 yards on the field and put it on a spot is – the kind of guy they want and working with a quarterback that already has a lot of that thought process involved is, is probably a good place to start from. I think that's a lot of what makes may a good fit for what they want to do.
And I don't think that you need uh, uh, drunken draft goggles to put them on and see Matthew Stafford in Drake May. I uh, mean, he is, he is such a big guy. That was another thing I was looking at. Like His dude. size is actually similar to Eli Manning. So he is a yeah. big dude. And then the way that he throws the football, the risks that he takes, the gutsiness. But another part of it, Ben, too, is that I, I don't think that Kevin O'Connell wants anything more than a quarterback he can develop and can be his guy. And – you know, he did that to some extent with Kirk Cousins, not exactly yeah. in a development, but make his guy and kind of be on that same page. Uh, but the fact that Drake May is young as well, and I mean, he's coming from a program that was not that great, didn't have great teammates. Like he's going to have a, a pretty big learning curve. And I think that's what we're talking about with Sam Darnold. But to take a young player with these raw tools that are Stafford or Eli Manning esque, along with that mentality that you can take risks and put it down the field with these receivers, it all just ties in. Now it's just making it happen. And I, because I, I th if they did that, the off season gets an A plus for me. I, I don't even know what flaw we could even find in it. If they were able to trade up land, Drake may rebuild parts of the defense and have their cap set up for next year to look as good as they did. And they even added a good running back. I mean, so they got yeah. you know, every box checked if they can get to the finish line with this trade up and get their guy. Uh, where do you think, or let me, let me phrase it this way. How bad did Kwesi Adolfo Mensa need this to happen? Because I think that from his perspective, we, uh, he seemed nervous that Kirk was going to say yes. That's how he's always <laughs> seemed. He, and I think that this was, his plan from the very beginning and it is being executed the way that he wanted to do it. And this is why I always tried to say, let's be patient. Okay. The 2022 draft total calamity, but let, let's, let's see it all come to fruition before we judge this. But I also think that like from his perspective, we know what happens to GMs who try to work around a Kirk cousins contract. It's not easy. And you end up looking dumb sometimes because you have to, sign Marcus Davenport rather than Jonathan Grenard, which is a much safer yeah. and a much better pickup. So I think from his perspective, he needed this to happen in order for him to execute his vision for this franchise. Yeah. I mean, they came in in this weird spot where this competitive rebuild, the, the, the phrase that you will hear us use more than you'll hear Kwesi use. Cause I think he vowed last week, he said that phrase, which I'm never going to use again. I, I assume that's the phrase he was referring to was competitive rebuild. That was always a tricky spot to be in because they didn't have the cap space. They had all of this dead money from years of Rick Spielman and Mike Zimmer trying to kind of save their jobs and, and have a competitive team on the field, knowing that they were not built for a full teardown and nobody would have the patience for one with that group. If they had brought everybody back, it would have kind of continued this weird thing of, of you have to hit on every draft pick. You have to hit on free agent signings. You have to be able to massage contracts every year. It is not a big margin for error to do that. And we've heard Quasi kind of allude to that at times of, you know, this is this is the way we've chosen to do it, but this is a really tough way to do it. And I think the fact that they, I mean, you can even go back to last year with Eric Kendricks, Adam Thielen, they did not push any of that money into the future. It was not, let's make these guys post June 1st cuts so that we can save some of the money and kick it down the road. It was no, we will take the hits. Now we will get this thing reset. I think there has very much been a mandate. If not from ownership, I, I think Quasi has interpreted part of his job as I need to get the cap reset. I need to let some of this stale air out of the building so that we actually have some maneuverability to do what we want and build a team that is is young and affordable and all of these things. I, I do think he has looked at it that way, and I think the Wilfs, to a degree, have been intrigued by this thing of, well, if we get a young quarterback, you get four or five years of financial cheat code if the guy is good. So, yes, there was interest in Cousins, but I, I think all of these things that we're talking about did create a little bit of a buffer in how far they were going to go. And we have seen GMs, we've seen coaches in the past, we've seen the previous regime say, well, you know, I know we weren't probably supposed to do this, but man, Anthony Barr really fits well in our defense and he's having second thoughts with the Jets. 
So, ah, oh, what the heck? Let's just go do it. I, this was not going to happen the same way with this group, I don't think. I, I think there was certainly a firmer boundary to this whole thing. And some of that was having a young quarterback. Some of that was the cap ramifications of Kirk Cousins versus a young quarterback. So all of that led to this kind of, I mean, we heard him talk about it. This like, yeah, we want him back, but it's a negotiation and we have our interests and he has his and it kind of has to be on our terms or at least compatible with what we want to do if he is going to come back. And and I think that this is something that, you know, we just sort of cruise by. You bring up the Wilfs here and they've taken a lot of arrows from the fans for not ever being willing to tear it all down. But yeah. I, I do think in this case, we have to go back to even last off season to give them credit because what we know is that if they want something, then that's going to happen, which is how sure. it works in the NFL. Don't, you know, don't make that about a Minnesota thing. Uh, no. That's absolutely everywhere that the uh, Jim, Johnny Manziel ended up in Cleveland is Jimmy Haslam wanted him. Right. And, well, okay. That's what we have to do. Right. So like, this is, uh, this is how life works in, uh, in the big city of the NFL. But uh, last year they allowed Quasi Adolfo Mensa to move on from those older players. And how many times would you say a team wins 13 games and then says Sayonara to multiple pro bowlers? Yeah. I mean, what? That was like five pro bowlers. They let walk out the door. That is a yeah. very rare thing. And I think that the reason that they're most set up to succeed is because of that. Because once again, with the like God closes the door and opens up a window, Josh Metellus emerges all of the sudden. Ivan Pace Jr. gets his opportunity. Yeah. We saw some young players start to emerge here. And how about Jordan Addison as well being their first round draft pick? I don't know if that's the case. If they're not losing Adam Thielen, they probably would have just run that back and drafted somebody else. So I think that like sometimes you're afraid of what is behind door number two, when in the NFL, it tends to reward you for saying, you know what, a you know 32 year old wide receiver or a running back who's kind of washed, like it's time to move on from those guys. And you can ultimately set yourself up for a better position. And I think that's why when I look at this whole thing, the 2025 cap situation is kind of like the ace in the hole, I think, for yeah. this team, where it's like, right now you're seeing a little bit of it. Jonathan Grenard is a day one signing. Andrew Van Ginkle, these are good free agents. But sometimes Khalil Mack becomes available via trade or Tyreek Hill or Devontae Adams or whatever. And suddenly you can be the player in that situation. I think we could look at what Miami did with those things. They trade for Bradley Chubb. Like that's sort of now a model for the Vikings. It's not just who you could sign, but it's also who's miserable player or player they don't want to pay or can't afford to pay that you can acquire. So to me, that is the biggest element of this that we have to give credit to the ownership for is allowing it to get there. Like seeing the part one, part two, part three of letting those players go. Yeah, I agree, and because this has not been the way the Wilfs have wanted to do it. And maybe they are not, and I'm sure when we hear from Mark Wilf in a week at the owners' meetings, he won't be conceding that this is going to be a rebuilding year. Even if you look at the state of the division, you look at the state of the roster, and you, you have to probably say it's more likely than not that it will be a rebuilding year. But they have not ordinarily been the team that signs off on that idea, and maybe some of it is – if there's a quarterback behind door number two, which I, I suppose the times that we've seen them at least flirt with this would have been 2011 when they had to draft a quarterback. They missed on that pick, obviously, with Christian Ponder. 2014, first year with a new coach. They take Teddy Bridgewater. That was not so much of a hard rebuild because they still did some things in free agency that year. But there was more of this vision for the whole thing around Teddy Bridgewater and Mike Zimmer kind of building that partnership together. Obviously that didn't happen because of Bridgewater's knee and then you pivot to cousins. But I wonder how much of it was being able to show them, Hey, this is not just a tear down for the sake of let's hope we hit on some picks. There is a plan to this of let's get our quarterback. Let's reset everything around that player. And then let's go from there. It, it has been a while since they've been willing to do this. So I think some of it is credit to them. And I have to think, some of it is credit to Quasi for being able to explain it and say, this is where I want to go. This is what I think we can do with this and, and kind of being able to sell the plan. Because I, I do 
get the sense with the Wilts that if the people they put in place say, this is why I think this needs to happen and why I think it's the best course of action for our franchise, they're not so stubborn that they're going to say, no, I don't care. I want to do this because this is what I watched Parcells do in the 80s with the Giants. I, I think they tend to be, well, if you think this is the best thing for us and you think it's going to work and you've explained it to us, then we're going to support it and we're going to be behind you. And if it doesn't, then we'll deal with that later. But I I do think they are the types of owners that let their football people kind of advocate for what they want. And when it makes sense, like I think it did here, um, there is, I think, there's there's enough runway to get that plan in the air, so to speak. So the way that Kwesi described it was essentially presenting options to them. And yeah. of course, they're going to pick the overall direction, but that makes sense to me. And uh, maybe you push one option a little bit harder than the others if you're yeah. Kwesi Adolfo Mensa, but he understands it. He understands this advantage that we've seen teams getting. And I think it was Robert Mays of The Athletic who tweeted out something like 11 of the last 12 teams that went to the Super Bowl, or 11 of the last 12 Super Bowls have featured a team with a quarterback on a rookie contract. We all know that by now at this point. I think it's one of the major reasons why Vikings fans are so up on this idea rather than saying, whoa, whoa, you got rid of our quarterback, but they've seen it work for so many other teams. Hey, those San Francisco 49ers are pretty stacked. Oh, is that because their quarterback makes $800,000? Yeah. Like you think that uh, Javon Hargrave was going to be there if he was making $40 million? Uh, probably not. Now, here's one thing I've, I've had a weird feeling over the last uh, week, I would say, Ben, which is I'm having trouble finding the the holes or the flaws. And so many times when you and I have done podcasts over the years, we've been tearing it down. We would say, oh, well, they're missing on this. They're making this mistake. Yeah. What are Rick and Mike doing? And, you know, Mike's losing the locker room and Rick's trading for Chris Herndon and our, you know, pets heads are falling off. We just got like all these things over the years. And I'm like now thinking, wait, do I, do I sound like too much on board with this? Uh, maybe because we had talked about this exact plan for a long time, but, but before we get to Justin Jefferson, I, I want to talk about an update there, but what am I missing? Am I missing something here? Am I missing something? Is it, if they don't get up to number three or number four, is that the sort of thing that could go wrong here? Like what, what am I not seeing that I should be criticizing, but I'm not. Yeah, I mean, I, I think at this point, it's hard to criticize it. The The criticism could come if they miss on the pick. If they either don't get up to get who they want or the guy they take turns out to be a bust because there is certainly that possibility. And history would suggest to us that one or more of these quarterbacks at the top is going to bust. You're probably not looking at the class of 1983 where it's like Hall of Famer, Hall of Famer, 10-year starter, 12-year solid play. I mean, you know, that that was kind of the – actually, three Hall of Famers in that class and then another solid starter with, with Ken O'Brien. You're probably not going to get that. You might, but history suggests that that's pretty unlikely. So if you end up with the quarterback that busts in this, then you have a problem because we've seen this cycle. We saw it with Christian Ponder where it's, well – we have to at least play the optics game long enough that people think we were right about him. And maybe Kwesi wouldn't do that to the, to the degree that Rick did. But they spent, I mean, Rick spent so much time talking about that 2012 season finale where Ponder had a number of big throws. Aaron Rodgers threw for like 370 and was throwing darts all day. But Ponder hit, I think, a deep crosser to Jarius Wright. And, hey, this is the sign that he can be the next guy. And his numbers compare favorably to Drew Brees and Eli Manning through year one and two. I mean, you heard a lot of those things. And then ultimately they realize Ponder's not the guy, so we lose a coach. And then you have to start this whole thing over. That would be the banana in the tailpipe is if the quarterback busts and then you're either playing this game of trying to convince everybody that he's not a bust, that you just need to give it more time, or it's how do we reboot this thing if – we have given up our 2025 first rounder. You're, you're not giving up on the new guy that quickly, but say you are investing assets into this guy and investing reputation certainly into this guy, and then you have to go back and do it again. That's where the questions become, okay, uh, you missed the last time. Are we going to allow you to do it again? I mean, with Rick Spielman, the answer was yes, and then yes again, and 
probably yes one more time. But are the Wilfs going to do that with this group? And what types of decisions get made by people who are motivated to save their skin? I think that's always the question. We saw that at the end with, with Zimmer and Spielman was when your motivation becomes, I'm trying to save my job because if I get this right for the long term and it becomes somebody else that gets the benefit of it, what good does that do anybody? That does start to change things. And we've seen all of that life cycle of miss a quarterback, try to hang on, try to put it back together, and then it's just try to save a job. We we saw that cycle. So that's the one thing I would say. But sitting here now, it's a good plan. It's just, you know, everybody has good plans on paper. It's, you got to make them work. Yeah, and uh, I'll bury this uh, take 35 minutes into the show that – I think that Bill Belichick and Mike Zimmer are basically the same guy, but one had Tom Brady. And and we all know this, that you are a genius or a fool based on whether that quarterback is great or not. And that's what, that's why Kirk cousins was always so difficult because he made geniuses out of offensive coordinators where people would say, wow, Kevin Stefanski got this much out of Kirk hire him. Uh, But he made fools out of head coaches because at the end of the day, they didn't win enough games. And if they draft a guy who doesn't work out, everyone is fired. I think we all know that. But the thing is, what's the other option? I mean, the other option was doing the same thing over and over again and ending up with the same results. And the same results are probably fired anyway. And uh, other than that, I mean, what, Russell Wilson? You want to be Pittsburgh? Yeah, no. When people were bringing up Justin Fields, I was like, "What, uh, what? Like, Justin Fields, do you want... Again, do you want to get fired? Like the only way to do this is to try to draft that guy and put him in the best possible position. And this is what I'm leaning on here, Ben, is that the Vikings are not going to trade Justin Jefferson to Cincinnati. Uh, I don't know where that comes from, but that was a thing for a minute uh, because it is so absolutely vital to the success of the player of what they have around him. And if you just went back and, and like totally changed things around, think about it this way. What if Christian Ponder had Justin Jefferson, Jordan Addison, Kevin O'Connell from the start? Now, is he ever a great quarterback? Yeah, Jerome Shadu and Michael Jenkins and Jerome Simpson. And then he doesn't lose his confidence, and he game manages his way to a bunch of wins because he's got great receivers. What if Teddy Bridgewater, who, by the way, was throwing to Charles Johnson and Johnson. Mike Wallace, what if Teddy Bridgewater came along at a different time where they had Diggs and Thielen, and, of course, his knee didn't explode? But the, They did have Diggs and Thielen just on the bench, right. which is the funny thing. <laughs> right. And It took them like a half of a month to see, hey, Diggs is pretty good. We should play him. Not only it took that, Charles Johnson getting hurt. Cordero Patterson as well, sitting on the bench and watching bad wide receivers. Although shout out Jerry's right. Who's a good player, but uh, not as on the bench for two weeks, not as good as Diggs and Thielen. But the point just being that when you look around the league, there's a couple guys who are transcendent. I really think that you could take the roster from the uh, Keanu Reeves movie, the replacements and put Josh Allen on there and he would win a lot of football games. I do not think that that is uh, the case with most quarterbacks. This scenario allows the highest percentage chance for your guy to succeed. And that's all they can really do. So I know that it always ends up in being fired if it doesn't work out. But as far as process goes, having the whole thing set up for the guy kind of actually reminds me of Carson Wentz in Philadelphia. He wasn't even that good, but they gave him like Elshon Jeffrey, Torrey Smith, the best offensive line in the league, a running game, Zach Ertz. Like you're doing everything you can to make this guy succeed. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think it's easier to get there when Kirk Cousins was not their pick or their free agent signing. They did not have the reputation staked in Kirk Cousins. They inherited Kirk Cousins. So it becomes a little easier to say we're moving on because there's not the admission that we were wrong or it didn't work out quite how we wanted that is attached to it when you weren't the one that signed him. So I, I do think that changes when it's the guy that you draft, but it also is not plausible to expect somebody that inherits a team, a new coach, new GM to go much longer without making a stamp on the quarterback position. They were going to do this at some point of we want to get our guy and we want to develop this thing in the way that we want to. And the way that it works out too is if you sign Justin Jefferson this off season, most of the years of Justin Jefferson's prime are going to come with a cheap quarterback. I mean, you are going to have 
Drake May or whoever it is that you take in the first round under a cheap deal through 2028. And that's going to bleed a lot of the cash of the Jefferson deal out. And then you're going to have to make a decision on Jefferson probably again, but that's fine. You, you'll deal with that in four or five years, but most of his prime, most of his, his big 25, 26, 27 years, you are going to pair him with a quarterback that's on a cheap deal. And in the, in the case of Drake May, you would be pair, pairing him with a quarterback that does not turn 22 until the end of August. So there is a lot of financial alignment in doing it that way as well. And, you know, we have seen a lot of teams get to this point with, do we have the expensive quarterback or do we have the expensive receiver? And the, the Packers got here with Adams. The Chiefs got here with Tyreek Hill. They obviously picked the quarterback. Both of those quarterbacks are going to be gold jacket guys that have Super Bowl MVP trophies. So that's a little different conversation than it is with Kirk Cousins. But you may have that discussion. They hope to have that discussion in five years if it's Drake May versus another deal with Justin Jefferson. But you can deal with that. The Chiefs showed us this year. You can deal with that if you have the quarterback locked down. So I think even those conversations get a little bit easier to do it that way. And uh, ultimately, even if it's a little bit of a bumpy road in the first year of it, I think financially it it makes a lot of sense and puts them in in a much different, probably much better spot financially than they were uh, for most of the time that either of us have covered this team. Oh, uh, by far. It's it's always been a discussion of – like waiting for you to tweet out how much uh, cap space they have, every structure of every contract, wow. looking, are there void years? There better not be. Ah, oh, there's void years for Dean Lowry. <laughs> Dang. Like, you know, that's uh, that doesn't have to be a thing uh, now into the future, or uh, those void years don't have to kill you now in the following season if you do have to put those into a contract. So uh, on the Justin Jefferson front, uh, uh, here's what I've been saying on the show, Ben. Everybody just take a deep breath. Just sit on the bench for a little bit, just chill, just relax, that Justin Jefferson will not sign until he knows what they're doing. Well, that's great because he was never going to sign today anyway. He was going to sign in August or early September. Uh, the way that these have played out historically is they always get a little ugly and they always get resolved at the end and everybody goes away a little happy and a little unhappy. And I think that that's what's going to happen with Justin Jefferson the same way it went with Nick Bosa that it so benefits him to just sign a contract that we'll get there. But along the way, you have to really ignore the noise because every insider wants to be like, could something happen here? Uh, Most of NFL content is built, and I'm guilty of this very much. uh, Could this happen? And you're like, well, in this case, I don't think anything other than him signing could happen. But uh, am I wrong in the way that I have been talking about? No, you're not. And I I think on the NFL content front, it's the nature of the beast when we cover a league that plays 17 games and not 162. We we just you spend more time in the NFL than than in any other sport talking about what could happen or what might happen or I guess digesting at a deeper level what did just happen because there are just fewer things that actually happen than other sports in the in the pure sense of this game was played. Here's how it went. Here was the score. That we we don't have as much of that to go with. So there's a little more of that built into the nature of this particular beast. But no, I, I don't think that you're wrong by telling people to take a breath because number one, these things don't get done in March. They get done when it's about time to go to training camp or it's about time to get ready for the season. I don't think after last year when Justin Jefferson turned down a deal that would have made him the highest paid receiver in the league, to hold out for a little bit more money, which is his right to do it. It was two years out. It's fine. But then you get hurt and then you see the risk you are taking by not signing that deal. I think the fact that he missed as much time as he did, if that happens to you in your free agency year, that's a different story. I don't think he will turn down the money at this point because ultimately all of this stuff, we can talk about positioning as much as we want, but in the end, it comes down to a 24 year old staring at a check staring at a a contract that has, we will give you this much with this many zeros in it in a signing bonus right now to say nothing of the base salaries. You will get a check next week for this much. And you can either choose to walk away from that or you can say, I'm taking that and I won't have to think about money for the rest of my life. 
no matter what happens, if I manage it the right way. So I think it gets done. I think there's every incentive for it to happen, both on his side and theirs. And I I get it that you'd want to understand what's going to happen with the quarterback. I, I just don't see it as an issue because the timing allows that to happen anyway. It, they're going to do what they're going to do at quarterback. I think they will keep him abreast of what they're going to do. I think that's fine. But I don't think ultimately – him making the quarterback pick is going to happen, nor is it going to need to happen to get him to sign a contract. I, I just don't think it's that big of an issue. It is one of those things where everybody has a vested interest in either, you know, carrying a certain side of it or just digging it up again for something to talk about, you know, whatever that happens to be. The motivations for that don't have a whole lot to do with how this actually goes. And I think, in the end, whether it's July or whether it's August, he will have a deal done and they'll be doing the, the press conference with the bro hugs and everybody will uh, live happily ever after, they hope, uh, beyond that. So I, I don't see it as an issue whatsoever. Well, and uh, yeah, that's how I've been looking at it. And it's just that we've gone through this many times. We, we've we just yeah. seen it play out and it always has drama. And then at the end of the day, everybody says, all right, it's kind of like the, uh, the office scene where they're all pointing finger guns at each other. It's just like, well, I'll, I'll leave. Like, and then they're like, no, you won't. Cause you can't, cause there are franchise tags. And it's like, well, what are you doing at quarterback? And it's like, it's not your business. <laughs> like, it's, you have nothing yeah. to do with that. Yeah. I'm the GM, you know, it's kind of funny, but we'll get there. I think. Uh, and if we don't, then I'll be quite shocked. Uh, I do have a present for you, Ben, the, okay. um, uh, to finish the show, the Minnesota Vikings hired Josh McCown. What a dream oh, come boy. true. <laughs> what a dream come true. I mean, all the years we've talked about Josh McCown in different ways. Now he's here. I can't wait to meet him. We haven't met him yet. Uh, uh, just, I'm excited. This guy has been everywhere. And what I want you to tell me is all the places he's been. So I have his Wikipedia page <laughs> up here uh, on my phone, and it's got listed all of the teams that Josh McCown played for. And I feel like it should be even more here. But uh, how many of the teams can you name that Josh McCown played for so we are looking for a total of 12 is that right Two, four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve technically 13 because one was in another league <laughs> oh yes yes there was like a ufl thing or something <laughs> there was but okay. uh it, that counts if you don't get it i'm not i'm gonna pass on that one okay i'll now. give you that one he put in 2010 he played for the hartford colonials of the ufl Shout out oh. to the UFL. Great league. Denny oh. Green, Dante Culpepper in that league. Yeah. Who was uh we can we can do a deep dive on the Hartford Colonials another time, but I'm, I'm sure it was an epic run with that franchise. <clears throat> uh we had the Cardinals. Yep. Uh, as any Vikings beat writer would know. He played oh, for the yeah. Cardinals. Yeah. Threw a notable touchdown pass to Nate Poole. Um the Browns, which is where he would have met Kevin O'Connell. Correct. 2015, 2016. Yep. Yep. The Jets, where he met Sam Darnold and the other half of that meme with them fixing their hair. Yes. Um, yeah, it's a great meme. I mean, it is. It, is. <laughs> it was a great moment that they caught that. Um, the, are the, are the bucks in there? The Tampa Bay bucks are remember that, uh, he had, uh, an Epic run with another team that you haven't named yet and got a pretty big contract to be oh, yeah. the quarterback of the bucks. And, um, it didn't work out too good yeah but who did okay. he have the epic run with now you should remember this epic run um it's like a it was like a seven game absolute heater for josh mccown yeah yeah gosh who the heck was that with um it's not far from oh, home though hmm? the bears that's right yes the bears yep yes that's right yes he did have a a, a crazy run with them. they've had a few guys that it, they've made momentarily famous with some of those types of runs like Jim Miller in the, uh, I think that was the guy in 2001 that they just, they won 13 and three and caught every possible break. And I think that was the guy, but. Well, they had a Kyle uh, Orton where he threw like nine touchdowns and they won 13 games. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah they've had a couple of those kind Rex of seasons. Grossman and so forth. Uh, yes, all right. Exactly. So yeah, you, you got some work to do still here. Titans, I think, right? Did you say Titans? Yeah. Uh, he was not with the Titans. No. Okay, so let's see here. Texans? Texans is correct. Yes, yep, 2020. Yep. Uh, okay, so that's six. Uh, was he in 
Buffalo at one point? He, he was not. He, he played in a playoff game with another team, though. Yeah, let's see here. Um, Quarterback got hurt. He came into the playoff game. It was his one and only playoff game. Played pretty well. Wow. Now, all those years, he only had one playoff game. Uh, gosh. Why am I getting stumped on these? Um, quarterback got hurt. That would be the Philadelphia Eagles where he came oh, in. Oh, yeah. I, was played say, I knew there was game. an Eagles thing yep. in there. But, um, was there a Seahawks in there? There was not a Seahawks. He played receiver briefly for a team, though, that you haven't mentioned. Gosh. <laughs> Uh, You're gonna have to sharpen so up your McCown. The, we, this guy's so in the building. In it's kind of hard. Um, there's some I the, didn't remember, but this one the I did. Colts. Well, the Colts were in there, right? Uh, the Colts are not. He played receiver briefly for the Lions. Oh yes, yes. And then there are um, some other ones. Uh, do you want you want another guess or two, or should I reveal some of the other ones? We should. I will take like one more guess, but I am doing poorly enough at this that we should cut it because it's not that interesting for people to listen to. Um, yeah, it feels like there has to be like a. Is there a Bengals in there? There's not a Bengals, but you're yeah, you're sort yeah. of like barking up the right tree. So I'll just take you through Josh yeah, McCown's Ravens? career here. Start off with Arizona, then to yep. Detroit. Oakland, which I kind of forgot. Ah, uh, yes. Miami, Carolina, Hartford Colonials, 49ers, Bears, Bucks, Browns, Jets, Eagles, Texans. And then uh, was the quarterback coach last year for the Panthers. And now he has arrived with us at TCO yeah. Performance. It's a storied run. He, he, he's sort of the quarterbacking equivalent of Levon Hernandez, where it's like he's picked <laughs> for everybody and uh, he's just got a lot of. A lot of stories, a lot of information, a lot of knowledge to I carry on from all those years. Cannot cannot wait to uh, run through some of that with him. Uh, ben, great stuff, um, except for yeah. I'm disappointed in the McCown guessing. But I'm a little disappointed that, myself, too, I got to be honest. Well, you know, you've been focused on some other things over the last week or so. A busy week. <laughs> so, yeah, but I, uh, I, mean, I, I got half, but then uh, kind of fell apart. Yeah, yeah, so. yep, yep. Well, you would think also that random guessing would actually do well for you with uh, this, but you just, you know. Seriously, just, like there's enough teams that you think you just got to bark up the right tree with some coach that's been around a long time that brings him in. Uh, just throwing darts like the NFL draft. Uh, anyway, yeah. uh, great stuff though, Ben and uh, yeah. the Vikings access podcast, the must listen to with you and, and Kramer. And of course the star tribune um, really don't have to tell people where to get that. So uh, great stuff as always. And uh, we'll see each other down at the owners meetings and uh, we'll go from there in a very interesting off season. Thanks, man. Yeah. Sounds good, man. Thanks for having me. Always fun.